He has called us to be priests, to serve his God and Father. That is what a priest does, guys. A priest was a vocation created by God to be in the service of God for the people so the people could know God. We're all called to know God now in as much as we can on this earth, to seek him with all of our hearts, and we are called to make him known. We are gonna turn to Revelation chapter one today. Guys, I've been looking forward to getting here for a while. And, <laughs> and um, I can tell you, uh, Revelation and eschatology was a class I took back at ORU, and it was, it was just about that. It was just about Revelation, end time events. And our very first session, we walked into that class and we are, we're ready for, it's like, tell us, tell us about all the things, extrapolate and, and explain what, what this book is, this, this book that has so much mystery to it and, and so much, uh, you know, you, you look at it and how intimidating it is and all the things that, that uh, get prophesied um, that will happen and we asked, uh, Dr. Wilson was our professor and he had a doctorate in this particular book. And he was just so forthcoming right there at day one. Like this man who'd spent at least two decades um, just researching this in the Greek and just really, really going, going into it. And he stood in front of all us theology students and he was just like, so there's a lot of great stuff in here and I will 100% let you know, I do not have all the answers in it. And we look at him and we're like, what? But then how do we, you're not gonna just tell us what to think about all this stuff? And he was just like, no, we can't know and that's okay. We can't know for sure about everything that's gonna happen. But then we got into a lot of stuff uh, because he let us know that he's like, there are some literal parts that we're gonna read in Revelation. There are gonna going to be some parts that are metaphorical, um, that are going to use symbolism. And I want to let you know, as we get into it, it's not my intention to go chapter by chapter through this book, like I have other books of the New Testament, but I will, I will be touching on a lot of it. Um, there's a stigma, I think, with this particular book of the Bible, that it's all about end times and Armageddon. That is definitely there, but um, Revelation is more than just the apocalypse. That is what Revelation is translated from, by the way, apocalypto. That is what it means in the Greek. And would you be surprised to know that apocalypto doesn't mean end times, doesn't mean end of days or the end of the world. It doesn't mean that. It just means to reveal something hidden. That's what it means. It is God pulling back the last chapter and showing us not an ending, but a beginning. It is a book of judgment, but also of hope and truth and poetry. There are so many verses in Revelation that we use in worship songs because they're just so appropriate when it comes to worshiping God. There are so many scenes in, in Revelation uh, about, about his creation, uh, about us worshiping him, about being with him, about communing with him, about what it is to know him and to be close to him and how there is eternity waiting where we will know and be fully known by him. There are so many commentaries on this book and so much speculation and 
I'm not going to get into most of it. I'm going to keep the main thing the main thing. And if someday I come back and, and bring some real serious exegesis into this, then so be it. But for now, uh, here's some basic hermeneutics before we get into it. This book was penned by the last living disciple, John. He is the only one out of all the 12 that followed Jesus um, that has not been martyred, but not for lack of trying. Because the Roman authorities forced him to drink poison, but he didn't die. They lowered him into boiling oil, but he didn't die. And not just he didn't die, he wasn't hurt. The Roman emperor at the time, uh, Do Domiton, decided that since they couldn't seem to kill him. They'd exile him to the island of Patmos, an island in the Aegean Sea where they sent prisoners. And not just any prisoners, but the most dangerous prisoners. This was essentially like a, a Roman Alcatraz. And Paul has been sentenced here. And they think he will most likely die there. Uh, spoilers, he does not. But when he gets to Patmos, the prisoners being dropped off there, they're sorted into two groups. You had the common criminals who would, as soon as they set foot on the island, just to be like, hey, we don't want no trouble here. It's a small, desolate island. Do not cause trouble for us. As soon as the common criminals got there, they just whipped them, just whipped them on sight. Just like, this will happen every time you step out of line. Then they at least got to go um, into uh, an open-air prison-style place where they would be uh, at least have their meals taken care of. Then you had the political prisoners, which is what John was. The, the common criminals get, get locked up on this island, but the political prisoners are told, go fend for yourself on this desolate island. Just, just figure it out. Just try to survive on your own. Uh, they were to find their own food and shelter, and many would die trying. So John is old. Uh, what hope does he have of surviving here? It turns out quite a lot. Because Jesus had something to reveal to him on this Isle of Patmos. Something that he was going to say, not only am I going to show this to you, I want you to tell people about it. I'm gonna, I, I saved you from poison from boiling oil, I'm going to save you from this desolate island because you're going to go back and you're going to declare this book. You're going to show this to people. People are going to read it all throughout the ages. Um, this is a reminder to us that God has a plan and a purpose for you till the day he calls you home. John had a job to do while exiled. Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament while under some form of house arrest or, or worse, in a, in a dungeon-like uh, place. Think about that. How many of you, when push comes to shove, when the bottom drops out, do we just want to hole up and lick our wounds and, and just have that moment where we're just like, well, I guess there's no point now. Like, there's nothing else for me to do. And yet these two men, Paul and John, they could have given into their situation, been all mopey, but they submitted themselves to the Holy Spirit who had them put pen to paper and write down verses that are still growing us and still challenging us today. As we read this, I do, I, I want you to, to go into this with eyes on Scripture, and I do, I pray that you can feel the power right here in this first chapter, that you can see how it builds, how the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray right now that you leave knowing a bit more about the character of God than he did when you came in as he is revealed to you. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, 
Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So that's just the first half there. Uh, I believe, as verse 3 says, that you are blessed just to hear this and to take it to heart. You are blessed if you hear and take it to heart, understand who it is, we're talking about. In this book, God is revealed in ways we so often forget or take for granted. It is that moment. I very much love that moment in the Bible in, in uh, Exodus where we see the burning bush with Moses and just through that bush, Moses, Moses has an encounter with the living God, a God that he has not known in this way, in this capacity. And he just has that, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. There is a holiness um, that, that just hits you right off that first passage right off the bat of who we're talking to, who we're talking about, who is, who is revealing himself to us. It feels deeply personal. He is an awesome God, and he is worthy of our praise. We see in verse 1 that this is a predictive prophecy about something that must soon take place. And verse 3 says, The time is near. The Greek text here makes it plain that it is coming, but not necessarily that it's coming today or tomorrow or even a hundred or a thousand years from now. The Greek phrase used here is en take, which means suddenly coming to pass. It'd be like if I took a balloon and started blowing it up, but I first asked you, when will it pop? Give me a time. How many, how many seconds would it be until that balloon popped if I just kept blowing air into it? You couldn't tell me, right? You couldn't tell me accurately when it would pop because it depends on so many factors, like how hard I'm blowing, uh, if I let any air out along the way, if I stop to catch my breath. But when it does pop, it will happen all of a sudden. The revelation from the one who was and is and is to come from Jesus Christ will happen. And when it does, it will be all of a sudden. Everybody remember COVID? Probably. That was a, a fun time. It's probably forever etched in this generation. Remember how it started with rumors and speculations? And it's like, oh, this thing is happening overseas. And then it's uh, happening on our borders and then suddenly it's in our town. And it felt like it was, it was a thing that we might have to worry about, and then all of a sudden it was here. That is what this predictive prophecy will be like. Um, it may happen today or tomorrow or a thousand years, but it will happen, and when it does, it will happen all of a sudden. 
Turn with me to Daniel 7. And if you're really ambitious, Zechariah 12. We have multiple Bibles. You can use two or three. You can get crazy here if you want. But keep your bookmark there in Revelation 1. Here's the thing, though, about hmm? Daniel 7. I'm going to reference it a couple times. So um, the really cool thing about Revelation is we're going to see Scripture called a Scripture called a Scripture. There's so many cool highlights in here as uh, the Bible keeps calling back to itself, keeps affirming the word. What's great is we do not need to fear this uh, end times prophecy that we will look at because in the very next part, it goes off on who is for us. Jesus, who is faithful, who is resurrected, who is king of kings, who loves us and has freed us of our sins by his precious blood, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. But look at what he has called us into there in verse 6. Back in Revelations 1, sorry. We're, we're in two places at the same time. He has called us to be priests, to serve his God and Father. That is what a priest does, guys. A priest was a vocation created by God to be in the service of God for the people so the people could know God. We're all called to know God now in as much as we can on this earth to seek him with all of our hearts and we are called to make him known. And we are all called to do that now to the glory of the Father and of the Son. So in verse 7, Scripture calls to Scripture, as there is a quote taken directly out of Daniel, verse 13, which says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Both Daniel and Revelation are talking about Jesus, and so was the prophet Zechariah, who gets referenced also in that passage in Revelation 1, verse 7. We see it in Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. For John and the church and for us, it is revealed who this Old Testament prophecy is about. And isn't that just so amazing how much the coming of Jesus was foretold? How not just his coming, but his life and his death and his resurrection, almost like God is outside time and space, working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He can do that, for he is outside time, for he was and is and is to come. So back to Revelation 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I hope we all read that verse and got convicted, because I know I did. What does John say is ours in Christ? Suffering. The way that Jesus suffered we are to suffer, laying down our lives and picking up our cross. That's, that's a real, real feel-good thing, right, that, that we do from the pulpit. What'd you learn? What'd you learn at, at church today? Uh, we learned the word to suffer. Yeah, guys, that's always, every time we go against our flesh, every time we deny what our flesh wants to do, we suffer, right? If, if we just say, no, I'm, I'm going to, get up in the morning, 
even though I would rather stay to bed and I'm going to get my butt to church and our flesh is just, oh, why? And that's, that's the easy kind. That's just the, we deny ourselves. Then you have like John who is on an island, a, a desolate, barren island, just trying to eke out every day, just trying to survive. That's a suffering that many of us have not known. I pray you haven't, but if you do, that's yours. It's ours. In Christ, suffering the way that Jesus suffered, laying down our lives, picking up our cross. Ours, in Christ, is the kingdom, which as we've discussed, literally means the king's way of doing things. The suffering that we go through to ensure the king's way of doing things is ever present in our life and patient endurance that we are able to stand every day and put on the full armor of God and do that again and again and again until he calls us home. John is doing this on an island prison by himself in a cave left to fend for himself and the Romans Hope he'll finally die here. But his is to suffer for the kingdom with patient endurance because he gets it. He's got it for a long time. It's not about him. It's about being a priest and serving God, being in complete submission to his will and doing what he would have us do in surrender and worship. And that is what God asks of each of us. All the time. Verse 9 again. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's a pretty great reason to be exiled, right? For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. May we all be willing to be rejected and ostracized for that. Verse 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Thyatira, sorry, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands, was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining, in all its brilliance. I love here that we see Jesus dressed like a high priest, but, but to the extreme, like the, the fulfillment, like the great high priest in, in all of Jesus' splendor and majesty and glory. In Exodus 39, 2, it says, they made the ephod of gold and blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen. They hammered out thin sheets of gold and cut strands to be worked into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen, the work of skilled hands. And if you look at Daniel 7 again, um, if you want to look at that, I'll, I'll reference here in a second. We see, uh, we see it's not just a ribbon of gold that Jesus has here in Revelation 1. The whole thing is gold. His head is white, which symbolized uh, what it symbolizes now, old age and wisdom, um, but it also calls to Isaiah for an even deeper meaning. Um, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And Daniel saw this vision of Jesus too back in Daniel 7 verse 9. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze, white as snow. 
like a lamb, like a perfect spotless lamb. His eyes like a blazing fire, which symbolically in the New Testament means judgment. His feet like bronze in a glowing furnace. That's a reference to the brazen altar in Exodus 27, which was the brass altar where the burnt offerings would be placed, the burnt offering of sacrifice, the animal that was to be completely consumed, giving everything. Turn with me to Hebrews 4. His voice was like the sound of rushing water. Have you ever been next to a waterfall? Like a really big one? And just tried to have a conversation? What do you have to do? Yeah, you have to shout to be heard. Uh, I just love how Jesus' voice is like this deafening cacophony of sound that is just, it's drowning out everything else. You can only hear it. It's powerful. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. And the text actually lists a specific sword here. Romphea. Um, like it actually calls out the name of the sword. This was not a precision sword. This was a sword that was meant to deal maximum damage. This was like the desert eagle of swords. Um, it was sharp on both sides so that no matter how it was swung, you were going to get cut. And you had to be very careful, uh, very, very well trained in how to use this thing because you could just as easily hurt yourself as hurt someone else. Why would Jesus have that coming out of his mouth. Herein we remember that at times, like a lot of other places in the Bible, there are parts that are literal and parts that are metaphorical. Jesus does not have a romphea actually coming out of his mouth. He has something much sharper. Something that deals much more damage because it goes beyond flesh and blood and cuts to the very soul. I've quoted it like three Sundays in a row now, but let's do it again. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any romphea. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So I love what's happening right here. The same word that was there in the beginning, the word that was with God and was God, that through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made, the same word that was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, and his light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That word, in full majesty and glory, his face shining like the sun in all its brilliance, stands before John and says, I need you to write down the word of God that I have for these seven specific churches. How many of you would like to receive that letter? knowing it's going to be brought with the full force of a double-edged sword that will cut you to the very quick, not of body, but of soul, that will challenge you in ways that your flesh does not want to be challenged. It does not want to hear this. As we go in to the next few chapters over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some hard stuff and we're going to put a microscope into those passages and we're going to then turn that back around to us and go, what are the things that we identify with here? What are the things we can do better? Check our hearts, check our minds, check our lives. I love how John is just the messenger here in this passage, but seeing his savior and his friend like this, 
Revelation 1 verse 17 seems very relatable. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I love how much Jesus cares. The full glory, the full majesty, and, uh, you know, John is just like, Phew. you know, like the song says, I can only imagine. I can only imagine what you would do right there in that moment. How would you react to seeing Jesus and all of his glory and majesty? Um, John falls to the ground as if dead. Um, and Jesus' first thing is to put a hand on him, establishing that point of contact, that that soft, gentle thing, that, and then says, do not be afraid. How, Guys, do you understand how much Jesus cares? If Jesus didn't care, he wouldn't even send John to, to put these letters, to write these letters down to these churches. We just let him go on caring about whatever it is they're ju- doing, but Jesus says, I got some course correction that needs to happen. I got some judgment that needs to happen. I need to call these people out. And these seven churches get called out here in Revelation. Um, Paul actually called out seven different churches during his Pauline epistles. These are not the only churches in the world. These seven do not reference all the churches. Um, but they are the ones that are being written to, and I believe there is so much that we're able to get from them. Um, he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Right, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So over the coming weeks, we're going to dive into those churches. Uh, They were not written to us, but I also believe we can read it and be convicted by it. And that's, when that happens, guys, that's that double-edged sword at work. We can, we're gonna, we're gonna look at the ways um, that we're, we might be refusing to grow or allowing sin at our front door or, or tradition or complacency uh, to have sway in our services. This is how we grow, guys. Not in numbers, but in our relationship. And how many of you know, growing can hurt. Uh, Anybody ever have growing pains as a kid? Yeah. You just wake up and you're like, why does this hurt? It's like, it's because you're growing. And I do, I believe that God wants us always to be growing. Uh, God always wants us to be knowing him. I would ask you as a body to begin to pray with us as we examine these churches, as we examine our own. Let us not look at these churches in ways that we might say, I'm glad that's them and not me. But in a way that says, God Reveal in us what's hidden and have us give account. I'd ask you guys to join us for prayer at 9.30 pre-service on Sunday mornings or Wednesdays at 6.30. These are times where we just come together to be in one accord, seeking God's face, inviting him to have his way, submitting to him, humbling ourselves before him. I really firmly believe we need this, guys. We cannot move forward without it. Maybe individually, yes, but together as a body, no. So I would, before I bless you, 
show up next week ready to be challenged and grow and see the character of God that wants us to draw near. Because he does not want to stay hidden from us. He wants us to know him. He wants to reveal himself to us. Not in a way that is scary end times, you're all going to die. But in a way that is a hand on you. That says, do not be afraid. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. We understand how much work it is to keep you. To be in your corner all the time. To be seeing you through from one thing to another. But that's because he's got a plan and a purpose for you. He needs you to get from where you are to where he would have you be. So as long as we have life on this earth, and as long as we are humbly and willing to submit ourselves to him, he's going to keep keeping you. May his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May you just feel the full weight of his joy and love that he has for you and the forgiveness of sins. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Peace even in troubled times. Peace even in, in times where we don't have all the answers. In Jesus' name, amen.